If you would like to support the channel, then please turn off adblock and refresh the page. Alternatively, use the link in the description below to donate to T1 Patreon. Thank you. Hello Magic Community on YouTube, I'm T1 Glistenrelf. It is time for a Patreon deck tech. Uh, for those of you that don't know, if you give to Patreon, give on the Patreon at a certain level, you get a deck tech every month. And Christopher Long gave at a level where he gets a card and I make a deck tech out of that. Now, he gave me Raider's Wake in Standard. That's actually, this has proven to be a harder card to make a deck tech for than Living Lands was in Legacy, and that's saying something. It's not that it's a bad card, but let me explain. So Raider's Wake, obviously you can see four mana, let me read it <laughs> while I have it here. Whenever an opponent discards a card, that player loses two life. Okay, so we're, we're at a good, st you know, off to a good start. At the beginning of your end step, if you attacked with a creature this turn, target opponent discards a card. Okay, so in a creature deck, say an aggro or a lower to the ground mid-range deck, you can use this as a way to strip the opponent's resources out of their hand, out of their late game, essentially and force them into top deck mode, and while you're at it, they'll start losing life, so it quickens your clock a bit. The problem is that, other than the 4 mana, is that when they have no more cards to discard, they don't lose 2 life anymore. And so at a certain point, it kind of just sits there. It's a 4 mana enchantment that doesn't do anything. Now, obviously, 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 there are some decks where this is extraordinary against. That's why it's a sideboard card, after all. If they're wanting to play Torrential Gear Hulk, if they're a Nico Bolas God Pharaoh deck, if they're a deck that wants to hard control you and play counter spells and instant speed removal, then yes, this is going to be a very good card because it strips those out of their hand. And even if they're just a control deck, that has enough that wants to get to their late game, stripping them of lands might prematurely cut them off from that. So Raider's Wake is still a good card, but it's so situational because uh, against the Ramanop Red decks, against the Black Aggro decks, against dinosaurs, against all of these lower to the ground decks, it just doesn't do enough, not at all. So that's been a bit of a trick for me. I can't m find a way to build around the card say, through a, a discard-themed deck, uh, because once you get to a certain point, the opponent has no more cards in hand, and they don't lose life from Raider's Wake anymore. It, it's, it would be like if the rack in Modern 8 Rack stopped working on turn 5. That, that's sort of the problem that we're dealing with here. And so, I decided that the next best step is not to make a Raider's Wake deck, but to put Raider's Wake into a deck that can easily utilize it. And what better deck than da 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 Mono Black Aggro? Now there may be some, there may be some better deck, but as far as I've seen, Mono Black Aggro seems to be the best at attacking every turn, uh, getting low to the ground, interacting. That, that, that may not be the best at all of those, but the specific combination, it does really well, interacting on a creature level, I should say. So, Fatal Push, Walk the Plank, uh, if you want to, you could run Supernatural Stamina, which is kind of a creature interaction spell, uh, etc. Okay, so this is what I've come up with for a Raider's Wake deck. Now, it's only going to have one Raider's Wake in the main board, but it has the other three in the side, and you can bring them in against the aforementioned hard control decks. Okay, we understand how the first bit's going to go, and actually, there's another thing I should note here. Something that I've been trying to do in Standard is, wherever I can, in a one-color deck, maybe even a two-color deck, I like Scavenging Grounds and Fields of Ruin. Field of Ruins? The Land Destruction one, the uh, Ghost Quarter for this format. Uh, and I like putting them into as many decks as I can. You have to be careful with how many colors you have when you do that, of course, because you're going to start cutting into your consistency more readily. But with a one-color deck, there's far less of an opportunity cost than, say, with a three-color Grixis Control deck. Okay, so that being the case, I'm trying it out. There's still enough Gifts deck that Scavenging Grounds is important, and other graveyard decks, and there's still, uh, <laughs> there's still enough transforming lands running around everywhere uh, that I'd like to be able to cut that off. Okay, so now on to the actual deck. 
So that does mean that we're running a bunch of swamps because it's a budget, it, budget, it's a mono black aggro deck. We're running two field and two scavenging grounds. Fair enough. And then we're running four if near, ooh, <clears throat> four if near deadlands, which makes colorless or makes black at the low, low cost of one life, but it also has another little feature added onto it, putting two minus one minus one counters on a creature. At sorcery speed only, but that's usually okay, I guess. We, we, what are we gonna do? It's still better than a swamp a lot of the time. Alright, so then after that, you can't say mono black aggro and standard without insectile aberration. Also known as bone picker. Now, it, it's clearly not the same card. Clearly. Uh, for one, you're not going to be dropping this on turn one, uh, of course, but Fatal Push into it or Walking Ballista on zero state-based action kills it and then you can get it. Actually, you could get it on turn one just because of that. There are Walking Ballistas in the deck. Play a Walking Ballista, a creature you control died thanks to state-based actions, and then you get a Bone Picker. A 3-2 Flying Death Touch, ta-da! Okay, so that is possible. <laughs> Alright, but that notwithstanding, it's just a really efficient creature. When you can actually get it out through the intended means, it's a really efficient creature. Uh, and Death Touch matters occasionally. Now, Dread Wanderer is the obligatory 2-1 for one mana that comes in tapped that we have in this format. <laughs> that's, that's just it. It seems like there, there's always one, and this one gets to be Dread Wanderer. And it can bring itself back from the grave. Cool, fair enough. Glint Sleeve Siphoner. Sleeve. Glint, glint Sleeve. Sleep. Alright, <laughs> is a card that gives us some card advantage. Now, there are other mono black lists that will run Ether Hub, and one of the reasons, even though they don't run anything else that cares about energy in the main board, is because of Glint Sleeve Siphoner. It's because you get an energy that makes it easier for you to start building card advantage with Glint Sleeve. We've eschewed that instead, of, instead for... Uh, let's see, the field and the scavenger grounds, the interactive lands, uh, instead of a colorless land that happens to either make a color or give us half a card, uh, which is what this ends up doing. It's a 2-1 with menace that actually can come up. Uh, whenever it enters the battlefield or attacks, you get uh, an energy counter, and then at the beginning of your upkeep. So, unfortunately, that means that the line is cannot be enters the battlefield, 1, attacks, 2, and then somewhere during combat you can use its ability. Unfortunately, that would be great. Uh, at the beginning of your upkeep, you may pay two energy. If you do, Phyrexian Arena. Draw a card, lose a life. Cool. All right. <clears throat> card advantage for when we start to get to the stage in the game when we've played out our hand and we're just looking for more. Uh, Night Market Lookout is... I don't want to like this card... But there's a reason it gets played in so many mono black aggro lists. I actually had to look this card up and, like, I had to look up the reasoning for why, because otherwise I really didn't want to put it in here. I wanted something else. I wanted uh, Gifted Aetherborn instead, the 2 3 Death Touch Lifelink. But no, this thing does work wonders, actually. It's a quick little clock, you know, one, and then they lose one whenever it becomes tapped. Yeah, whenever it becomes tapped. That matters for crewing, and it crews, uh, we have, we'll, we'll get to crewing in just a second, but even when you crew, they'll still lose life. So it's the most efficient crewing creature in the deck uh, for those that we do have. And also, when you're considering that it's still kind of a one mana two one, kind of, uh, and you're clearing the way with your creature kill, it can still be alright. All right. Plus, if it dies, it can turn on uh, Bone Picker, it can turn on Revolt for Fatal Push, uh, so it, it can be a little bit of a honeypot where they want to uh, block it, they want to chump block it, or just take it, kill it, and then they lose something later on. Okay. Ruin Raider is our Dark Confidant in Standard. <laughs> Ruin Raider is our 3 mana raid. So, whatever. You know. At the beginning of your instep, if you attacked with a creature this turn, reveal the top card of your library and put that card into your hand. You lose life equal to its CMC. So, it's your Dark Confidant. It sort of speaks for itself, but it also happens to be a 3 2. So, it's one of your biggest bodies in the deck. And similarly, it gets you out of late game not being able to draw anything. Okay. Scrap Heap Scrounger. Sort of speaks for itself, you're an aggro deck in standard, especially one that's running black. You're gonna be running Scrap Heap Scrounger. Duh, right? Alright. 
can't blow. Oh, and it crews one of our uh, one of our vehicles can't be crewed uh, by a lot of our creatures, but can by Scrap Heap Scrounger. Cool. There we go. Uh, Vicious Conquistador. Whenever it attacks, each opponent loses one life, and it's a one-two. So it's kind of Night Market Lookout five through eight. No, Night Market Lookout <laughs> is Vicious Conquistador. Five through eight. There we go. It's just having more of the same effect. Uh, we see where this is going. We're on a go wide strategy. And then only two copies of Walking Ballista. Uh, only two copies. Eh. I would like to have more, but what would I take out? <laughs> so it can turn on your turn one bone pickers. That's important. You can use it to take out. It, it's useful in the mirror or in other small aggro decks because it can actually trade with them uh, by dealing one damage. And later on in the game, it can just give itself counters, give itself counters, and you have a, a late game win condition. Uh, so those are all good reasons for having Walking Ballista, I would say. Uh, it Later on in the game, it can just become the biggest creature. Easy enough. Uh, then for our interactive spells, we have Fatal Push. Because it's a black deck in standard. No, it's because we're a low-to-the-ground deck that wants to clear out what our opponent has. We want to keep the ground clean so that we can keep attacking and attacking and attacking. Fatal Push's downside of only hitting up to CMC4 isn't as consequential when you consider that you're trying to win very, very, very early on. Or at least put them to such a low life total that even if they block as profitably as they can, they still won't be able to, uh, to survive. Because you are such an early game deck, Fatal Push is just the card. It, it just kind of is. Uh, hopefully you've beaten them by the time that they're getting out our Bloodbraid Dinosaur, our Thread Bloodbraid thrag, thrag Tusk, or, you know, have Sacrificed Gate to the Afterlife, or whatever their deck is trying to do. <laughs> All of the myriad things they could be trying to do. Uh, next we have Two copies of I hope this card is going out when uh, the next set road to comes in and we get more merfolk. It is Walk the Plank. <laughs> uh, it's our it's our sorcery speed victim of night, I guess, for this format. And it kills a creature, unless it's a merfolk. We're getting more merfolk in the next set, including um Oh, ooh, why am I Silvergill Adept, I believe. There we go. Merfolk is probably going to be at least decently positioned come the next set, and Walk the Plank is probably going to be the first one to go. In place of another Fatal Push, the fourth Fatal Push perhaps, or some Doomfall, or maybe there's some other card that you can think of. Okay, now, and I mentioned the one Raider's Wake. For our vehicles, we have three actually. We have two Ether Sphere Harvester, so three mana crew one, so Every creature in the deck can do that. And it's a 3-5. You gain some energy and you can spend energy to give it lifelink, which helps to negate a lot of the we're losing life effects in the deck, um, like Ruin Raider, for instance. Okay, cool, fair enough. Uh, and it's a 3-5, so it's a good blocker in the format. Then we have Heart of Kirin, which is 2 mana but crew 3. We don't care about the Planeswalker loyalty bit because we have no Planeswalkers in the deck. Uh, however, our Scrap Heap Scrounger and our Ruin Raider can do it on their own, and essentially it grants them sort of a pseudo-haste by transferring their ability to attack into the vehicle. Uh, so even when you get to a point where it isn't great to attack with, say, a Ruin Raider, you can still attack with it uh, using the heart. And Flying Vigilance also makes it a good blocker on the swing back if you have enough creatures that you can attack with it and then keep it back to block. Fair enough. We, we get all of that. Now, the sideboard is really tricky because I am not as into standard as I would like to be, and I understand that. So, what I'm saying here is just a bunch of suggestions, essentially. Uh, at the very least, I think it's you need to have four gifted Aetherborn. At the very least. And the reason is because they're just absolutely the most efficient creature against aggro decks. It's a 2-3 two, for two mana, with Death Touch and Life Link. So Life Link means it'll give you some life back against the red decks, and Death Touch means even against bigger creatures, you'll still be able to take them down. I'm looking at you, Carnage Tyrant. 
Alright, so that seems, seems like an easy one to bring in. And then, similarly, I would say duress should also probably go in. Uh, again, for those control decks, if you're trying to take out their interaction with your creatures, or their ability to go and find more lands to make their late game, or whatever the case, maybe there are combo decks that care about it, then yeah, I, I would put in duress. Um, of course, I'm also partial to whenever I play Black and Standard, I want to play Duress anyway. So, uh, I, I always like to get that information at the worst. Then it gets a little tricky, and I already mentioned Three Raiders Wake for the same bit, for fighting control decks. And then, I'm not sure, uh, for our last ones, I have two Doomfall. Now, Doomfall is important because it deals with a creature without destroying them, it exiles them, and that's important for all of these gods and hydras running around that really do not care about destroy effects. So Doomfall is consequential in those matchups. You'll use your Fatal Push and your Walk the Plank to deal with all the other creatures so that they have to get rid of their Hazaret or their Bristling Hydra with Doomfall. Okay. Then I want to have a little bit more Graveyard Hate, even though we already have some in the main board. And so, either Scavenging Grounds, or I've also considered the card Sentinel Totem. They're not the same thing exactly, of course. One is an artifact, the other is a land. Uh, Sentinel Totem scries when it enters the battlefield, and it doesn't cost any mana to exile all, all cards from all graveyards. Now, we don't care about our graveyards so much. Not, not a big deal. So, Sentinel Totem could go in instead of Scavenging Grounds. I don't... I... I would be curious to see which one is better. I do not know the answer to that. Maybe some more Sentinel Totems, so that we don't have to put in too many lands, or if we want to keep the same number of lands, have to take out some black lands. That might be the reason why. Alright. So, that's the deck. Uh, Chris, shoutouts to you. I am sorry that this wasn't my best deck tech. I know it's similar to a lot of decks that are already in the format right now, but Raider's Wake is a tough card, but I do appreciate the challenge, so thank you for that. And it made me think in a different way about Standard than I, I tend to try to. Uh, Alright, that's it. Take care, Magic Community, and I will see you later. Bye bye